Mr. Cleborn, we have House File 1830 back before our con uh, committee for consideration. Could you please move your bill? Thank you. Um, I will move the um, House File 1830. Let's see. I'm Thank you, uh, Chair Cleborn, and I see you. Oops. Oh, where would you like to send this, Madam uh, Chair? It will go to Ways and Means after this committee. So I move it to Ways and Means. <clears throat> if you move to Ways and Means, uh, we have an amendment. Uh, DE, can you explain the amendment, Chair? Thank you. And um, actually, what we're going to do this morning uh, is we will have a presentation by nonpartisan staff to please walk us through the bill. This is the state government appropriation bill. And with that, I would ask uh, that we move to nonpartisan staff to walk through the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to nonpartisan staff, um, who wants to start? Mr. Roberts, if you could state your name for the record and go forward. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'm Helen Roberts from the House Fiscal Staff, and I'm going to walk through the spreadsheet first. You have two spreadsheets in your packet. Um, one is the more detailed spreadsheet that starts with uh, a general fund summary and then detail going into uh, how the appropriations are put together. I'm not going to walk through that, but I do want to make sure everyone knows that I'm available um, for any member or group of members to walk through the more detailed information um, after committee. So what I am going to do is start with what's called the change item spreadsheet. And again, just in interest of time, since I don't think you want to just listen to me read a list of things, I'm going to sort of summarize things. Um, so to begin with, um, and again, starting with the change item spreadsheet, I'll note that the total spending for fiscal year uh, 24 and 25 is uh, $1.565 billion. This is offset by a fiscal year 2023 cancellation of $57.1 million. So that's how this bill meets the target of $1.5 billion, which is $400 million over the forecast base. And then I'll also note that the fiscal year 26-27 spending is $1.29 billion, which is $200 million over the base. Um, another thing to note is all the maintained current service level change items for the uh, agencies have been funded. So I'll start with the legislature, and you'll see that the, the increase is $74.1 million. Um, You'll, I'll just note, um, again, not going line item by line item, but there is a, a significant change in the LCC, and that is due to the reviser system request and also IT um, upgrades, including the uh, television services for the entire legislature. Um, also funded is the chair's legislative task force on aging, uh, LCC translation services, and then the IIJA advisory task force. For the governor, there's a change of $11.2 million, um, and you'll also note under that a reduction of $8.7 million. So this is where the governor's uh, office is transitioning from moving to where they bill out to agencies for a portion of their cost for their government relations staff, and instead have that directly funded in the governor's office appropriation. Uh, for the state auditor, there's an increase of $5.8 million, um, and you can see the different change items listed there. And again, if anyone, any member has a question, please um, feel free to stop me if I go too quickly. Um, moving on to the second page for the Attorney General, or <coughs> I might be on a different page than you, but uh, moving on to the Attorney General, the increase is uh, $37.8 million, and that includes some one-time spending of $9.9 .9 million, and then uh, $2.5 million for the enhanced antitrust. Um, move. To the Secretary of State's office, the increase is $2.3 million. Moving on to the cap board, um, there is $1 million in fiscal year 23. This is for the updated capital model design framework plan that we heard the bill on, I think, last week. And then an $850,000 increase for 24 and 25. And that does include one-time funding for um, commemorative works for the capital grounds. For the Office of the Administrative Hearings, um, there is a, a $2.37 million increase for the biennium. This includes $1.8 million in one-time funding for the public comment portal. Um, and then you'll see also that the majority of the funding for, the, um, for this office is from the Workers' Compensation Fund, so there are increases there also. Uh, moving down into minute services. 
$140.8 million increase. Um, largely, um, much of this is one-time funding. It includes the cybersecurity advancements, the enterprise cloud transformation, um, targeted application modernization, and then I'll point out that there is funding for Representative Freiburg's public land survey stem monuments. Uh, next, I'm going to move on to the Department of Administration. You can see this is a long list of items, a uh, $72.5 million increase for the biennium. This includes change items related to um, some of the larger ones are the space consolidation and relocation. That's $20 million at one time. The risk management fund property self-insurance of $12.5 million. Um, several change items related to grants management including increasing oversight, equity, um, the roadmap, and then oversight systems. And then there's some additional funding for, uh, for all of the public broadcasting, including public TV, AMPERS, and NPR funding. And then again, you'll see um, there's $5 million, the last item, for the updated capital model design a framework plan. Moving on to Minnesota management and budget. The total increase is $45 million. This includes um, $22 million for the Enterprise Resource Planning Systems funding. So that's for all of the enterprise uh, technology systems. Um, there's funding for a statewide internal audit office, um, an accountability and performance team, and then um, some other uh, change items, including Representative Ryer's bill that dealt with employees with disabilities, hiring, and retention. Um, under the MMB not operating, uh, two things that I'll note, note for you under fiscal year 23, you'll see there is that a cancellation of $58.3 million from the COVID-19 management account. So that's a reduction in 23 that counts against this committee's target. And then the other negative item you'll see is then the adjustment to agency budgets related to the change in the governor's office where um, agencies will no longer be paying for some of the governor's staff. Um, the Department of Revenue, you'll see their one change item for 41.6 million is the man maintain current service levels. Uh, Gambling Control Board, this change is from the Special Revenue Fund and then for the Racing Commission, um, a one-time one, $1 million general fund change for the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. The commission itself is funded through the Special Revenue Fund, so this is a uh, one-time general fund change. Um, now we're moving into some of the smaller agencies, and uh, most of the changes here are the maintained current service levels, so I won't touch on those. I'll try to point out a few different changes. Under the Amateur Sports Commission, for example, you'll see that the $850,000 for Representative Newton's ice arena roof upgrade is included. Um, some other uh, changes would be, for example, under the Indian Affairs Council, you'll see that there's some additional funding for a legislative and policy director and then for implementing the Private Cemeteries Act. Again, the rest of these are mostly maintained current service levels. There is some funding under the Minnesota State Arts Board, uh, line 186, for increasing grants oversight capacity. Um, moving to the Minnesota Humanities Center, uh, here's Two change items are increasing the funding for the healthy eating here at home, also known as the Markets Buck Program, and then some funding, uh, $5 million for civility and cultural awareness <coughs> programs and grants. Uh, for the occupational licensing boards, it's largely the maintain current service levels operating adjustment. So that brings us down to um, the end of the spreadsheet. There's some funding for the Campaign Finance Board uh, for 1.6 million for cybersecurity and MinGeo coding and cloud integration. Uh, $1 million to the Minnesota Board of Regents for the cut wall study. That's the bill we heard last week related to the, um, the, the falls in Minneapolis. And then um, $750,000 for the Science Museum of Minnesota for revenue recovery. And then at the bottom of the spreadsheet, you'll see um, there are some Revenue changes, one is uh, under administration, the parking fund debt service waiver, I'll point that one out. And then, um, just 
sorry, I'm just trying to reconcile where I'm at. Um, at the very bottom, you'll see the general fund reconciliation of, oh, I'm sorry, I wanna know, I'm missing this on this spreadsheet, I was looking for it. On line 263, you'll see a $7 million uh, number, and I, I'm missing what that is, and that is the transfer to uh, what we call the facilities repair and replacement account. And it's, it's an account in administration that is used for um, asset preservation for uh, various buildings. So that's some additional funding for that account, and I will fix that. Um, again, moving back to the end of the spreadsheet, you'll see at the end, you can see the general fund base online. 275 is 1.1 million. There are changes in expenditures of 449 million. So that's a 1.6 billion dollar um, spending then this is offset by the revenues and transfers and then again the 57.138 million in fiscal year 23 changes um, so that final net general fund spending for um, fiscal year 20 again my years are wrong in here I will switch those to uh, 23 through 25 is 1.5 billion dollars Thank you, Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Gearing? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll walk through uh, the policy article of the DE1 amendment. So Ms. Roberts has walked through the spreadsheet, and the uh, spending items reflected in the spreadsheet are uh, reflected in Article 1 of the DE1 amendment. So uh, my walkthrough will primarily orient you to Article 2 of the DE1, and that starts on page 22. Um, there is also, uh, in addition to the actual DE1 in your packet, there is a, um, not a, our traditional section-by-section -section house research summary, but there's sort of a table summary that gives a high-level overview of the uh, policy topics that are included within this article and the sections where you can find those. Um, so we'll start on page 22 of the DE1. Uh, the first uh, set of sections, sections 1 through 5, um, uh, reflect Representative Freiburg's House File 274. This is the bill that would um, establish the State Emblems Redesign Commission to redesign the official state flag and the official state seal. Um, those changes would be effective May 11th of 2024. Uh, moving ahead to section six on page 23, um, there's a couple of sections here that relate to budgeting at the legislature. Uh, I would highlight section seven, um, which is uh, provides a statutory appropriation for legislative operational funding for both the House, for, for the House, the Senate, and the Legislative Coordinating Commission. Um, on page 26, starting with section eight uh, and section eight running through section 13, are provisions that um, come out of the Legislative Audit Commission, the recommendations of the Audit Commission related to the work of the Legislative Auditor. Uh, so this is a Representative Hansen bill, House File 2770. Then moving ahead to page uh, 29 is the next uh, policy topic. Section 14 is the first of a series of sections that comes from the Governor's policy recommendations. Uh, there's a number of sections in this article that repeal references to the Office of Strategic and Long-Range Planning, and this is the first section that does that. Um, sections 15 and 16 are conforming changes that reflect the transition of the legislature to a statutory appropriation uh, format, so it eliminates the requirement that legislative budgets be um, considered by agencies in the same way as we... Uh, sections 15 and 16 reflect, uh, again, legislative budgeting process um, the tr to reflect the transition uh, to the statutory appropriation format. Um, starting in section 17, section 17 through 20, um, transition the existing compensation council, which, which currently makes recommendations for salaries of the constitutional officers uh, and judges, and instead um, would uh, provide authority for the compensation council to us out to actually establish uh, salaries for those officers rather than recommending them to the legislature. Uh, those changes run from section 17 uh, through 20. Uh, on page 31, section 21 um, is another section from uh, the governor's policy recommend recommendations. There's a appropriation in article one related to this. This is the establishment of duties at MMB related to accountability and performance management. Uh, section 22 is a uh, first section. There'll be a, a set of sections coming up in just a bit uh, related to grants oversight at the Department of Administration. This is a first section that includes a cross-reference related to those new changes. Uh, section 23 and 24 um, uh, is a governor's recommendation related to the way that MMB bills state agencies for um, uh, shared services like the SWIFT accounting system and other um, enterprise uh, systems that are used across agencies. 
Um, section 25 relates to the legislative budgeting process, prohibiting um, the Commissioner of Management and Budget from reducing uh, legislative appropriations through an unallotment process. Uh, section 26 uh, is the statutory language that uh, adopts or that enacts the Office of Enterprise Translations. Um, uh, within, the within the executive branch, there's an appropriation in Article 1 to reflect um, this change. And then starting on page 33, um, section 27 running through section 36 is the series of sections I mentioned uh, that provide additional grants oversight and um, um, within the Department of Administration. Uh, sections run through sections 20, section 36 on page 38. Uh, just a couple of things to highlight within these sections. One is um, uh, an authority for the Commissioner of Administration to approve <coughs> grants uh, effective April 1st of 2024. Uh, there's language in here related to administrative costs uh, that agencies may retain for grants and a number of other changes related to um, the way that grants are administered by state agencies. Um, Section 37 uh, on page 38 of the DE amendment uh, provides a statutory authority for um, MMB to provide cash flow assistance to, min uh, to Minnesota IT services. Uh, section 38 and 39 on page 39 of the DE uh, expands the um, permissible use of the um, ITA account or also called the Odyssey account uh, within Minute. Section 40 on page 39 gives authority to uh, Minute to provide grants uh, to counties and other local governments for cybersecurity and there's an appropriation um, in Article 1 uh, to fund those grants. Um, section 41 and page 40 is another conforming change to eliminating a reference to the Office of Strategic and Long Range Planning. Uh, sections 42 and 43 on page 41 um, expand the permissible uh, uses of the Healthy Eating Here at Home program to include um, additional types of farmers markets that exist in the state. Uh, section 40, uh, 44 on page uh, 42 is another reference to the Strategic and Long Range Planning that's being in, uh, repealed. Uh, section 45 at the bottom of page 42 is uh, a long section that provides a number of amendments to the Private Cemeteries Act. This is a section uh, that, um, that establishes requirements for how uh, cemeteries are identified, uh, treated, and human remains are treated and handled when they're discovered. Uh, moving ahead to page 49, um, section 46 and 47 uh, come from Representative Freiburg's bill uh, that establishes a public land survey monument grant program. Section 48 on page 50 uh, is conforming language that goes along with the legislative audit provisions that I discussed earlier. Section 49 on page 50 is the actual establishment of the State Emblems Redesign Commission from Representative Freiburg's bill. Section 50 on um, page 51 is Representative Cleborn's uh, legislative task force on aging. And then moving ahead to page 53, uh, section 51 is Representative Cagle's Infrastructure Resilience Advisory Task Force. And then the next section um, uh, is on page 57. Section 52 uh, requires the Commissioner of Administration to conduct a feasibility study related to the viability of implementing a grants management uh, system um, enterprise-wide within the executive branch. Uh, sections 53 and 54 related to are related to the CAP board. This is the bill that the committee heard last week. Um, section 53 has to do with the redevelopment of the Ford building site. And section 54 is the Capitol Mall design framework. Uh, section 55 is a conforming change to reflect the transition of the legislature uh, to the statutory appropriation model beginning in fiscal years 2026 and 2027. Section 56 on page 58 um, requires the Commissioner of Administration to conduct a study related to the um, needs of small agencies in state government. And then lastly, on page 59, are two repealers. One repealer relates to the State Emblems Redesign Commission, and the second repealer uh, is repealing a requirement that there be a polling place located at the Evergreen Township Fire Hall. And Thank Mr. Chair, that is the end of the walkthrough. Thank you, Mr. Gearing. Uh, Ms. Griffin? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, there's uh, nothing additional that I have to add for the walkthrough. So we have a little business to do here before we move forward. Um, yeah. Chair Cleborn um, <coughs> wishes to move her amendment to uh, the DE. Um, any discussion to that? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Now on to testifiers. Um, uh, first on deck is uh, Auditor Blah. And second will be the uh, 
Attorney General's Office, uh, Laura Sales. Auditor, please state your name and title for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Hewitt. Thank you, Chair Cleveborn, uh, Lee Nash, uh, and members of the committee. I'm Julie Blaha, your state auditor. Uh, first off, uh, a big thank you for the chance to come here and thank you. Uh, you uh, your support of the funding proposals that we put forward will make a big difference in our office, and I truly, truly, truly appreciate that. Um, also, though, I, you'll note you'll see two changes. Uh, I think the easiest way to understand them is on line 315, uh, is to read it that way, because that it kind of shows it how it is there. Um, from what we said before, one uh, addition is um, a CTAS upgrade and a compliance dashboard. Now, these proposals were based on some of the one-on-one -on -one conversations we had, we've had with all of you, feedback from local officials on our recent State of Mainstream Listening Tour, and just things from uh, several years of, of goals here. Um, first off, our popular Small Cities and Towns Accounting System, CTAS, uh, needs underlying code updates and further encryption of sensitive data. Now, the Office of the State Auditor creates, distributes, and supports the CTAS system. It helps local entities maintain accounting records, assist in bookkeeping, and facilitate submission of financial records to our office. It's basically QuickBooks for small governments. Uh, Entities that use our system on average are more likely to report required data to us on time and accurately, which is one indicator of fiscal effectiveness. And we are currently serving uh, 288 cities, 1,144 towns, 11 special districts. I have the list if you'd like to see if your community is here. Uh, and so our goal is to expand the number of CTAS users. Now, users appreciated our last um, upgrade and have had several requests for further improvements for ease of use and increased security. We believe an update grade will attract more users. Now, after that upgrade, we'll use any remaining funds to reduce the cost of the program to encourage more small cities and towns to use the software. Now, it's only a one-time fee of $300, but when you drop that price down, you can give people that final push to give it a try. Um, the second item, the regulatory compliance and oversight dashboard item, is in a response to calls to support better compliance with funding requirements and other rules from several corners. It's come up in committee hearings, individual conversations. Uh, so building a compliance dashboard, like we've seen in some other states, can make it easier for local officials and other Minnesotans to view their compliance requirements, monitor their progress toward full compliance, and find assistance to fulfill those requirements. The easier it is to track compliance, the more likely entities will be effective in meeting the requirements. For instance, it'd be great to be able to go to one place and say, hey, here's where we are in our TIF district. Here's if, how we are, where we are with our audit. Here's where we are with an agreed upon procedures. And you can see in one place if uh, you are there. And the public can see it as well. So overall, this budget uh, presented here would bring us just under what OSA funding was in real dollars at the, uh, and uh, inflation adjusted dollars at the beginning of the century. Um, and even with a chunk of one-time money, uh, this is a significant recovery and will go a long way to serving Minnesotans uh, in the way that they deserve. Thank you, uh, and I will be here whatever day you do questions. <laughs> thank you, Auditor you thank you. Right, thank you. Um, we have Ms. Sales come up, and then on deck is Commissioner Robert Davis. Uh, Chair Cleaborn, Representative Hewitt, Hewitt, sorry, Representative Nash and members. My name is Laura Sales and I'm the Legislative Director for the Attorney General's Office. Uh, Attorney General Ellison wishes he could be here today, but he is presenting the opening statements in the Jewel trial. So he asked me to pass along his thanks for including the Attorney General's fiscal year 24-25 budget requests in the omnibus state government finance bill. On behalf of all the hardworking public servants uh, at the Minnesota T Attorney General's Office and the people of Minnesota, we thank you for the support of the unique and vital work the Attorney General's Office does for Minnesotans everywhere. As A.G. Ellison has testified to your committee before, there has been a dramatic lack of investment in the Office of the Minnesota Attorney General over the last three decades, a lack of investment that is reflected in our staffing levels and ability to do the work needed to help Minnesotans afford their lives and live with safety and dignity. Part of A.G. Ellison's work since he first took office in 2019 and again in 2023 has been to rebuild the largest statewide public law office in Minnesota. Few law offices in Minnesota handle the range and complexity of civil litigation as the AG's office. Our clients include more than 100 state agencies, boards, and commissions, as well as the people of Minnesota. We handle more than 7,000 legal files per year, and every year the AGO is a net contributor to the general fund. Our work helps Minnesotans across the state. 
Funding these budget requests will help the Attorney General's Office retain an expert workforce and is probably one of the most important things we can do so that our office can meet the needs of Minnesotans. Our attorneys earn less than public attorneys for local metro counties and almost a third less than attorneys in the U.S. Attorney's Office. This gap in earnings can make it challenging for us to retain our public interest-minded attorneys. Our operating adjustment will also allow us to further support the backbone of the office. The capacity of the administrative, non-legal side of the office has been chronically understaffed. While employees of the office are very resourceful and cont continue to serve their colleagues well, the capacity of critical internal administrative functions like human resources, information technology, and finance are stretched beyond their limits. There is a lot to do to keep the office running, and we need enough people to do the work that needs to get done. Uh, I'd like to, lastly, I'd like to reiterate an important point that A.G. Ellison has made to you before, namely that the Attorney General's office is a great value for the state and the people of Minnesota. We bring in far more money than it costs to operate the office. In the last four years, the office has returned about $1.5 billion to the state and directly to the people of Minnesota. This includes about a billion to residential and small business utility rate payers and more than $300 million in settlements from opioid companies, with $200 million yet to come. These budget requests will put us where we would have been if the Attorney General's Office Fund appropriation had kept pace with inflation for the last 30 years. The dedicated public servants of the Attorney General's Office work hard to bring unique and significant value to Minnesotans in every part of the state, and they stand ready to do more with your support. Thank you for investing in them so their talents can continue to benefit the state. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Sales. <laughs> Commissioner Robert Davis, please, and Commissioner uh, Showalter is on deck. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I am Alice Roberts Davis, Commissioner for the Department of Administration. I'd like to thank you, Chair Cleavorn, and you members for including almost all of the governor's recommendations for admin in the omnibus state government budget bill. It is a pleasure to be addressing these great investments in state operations. Uh, as you know, the Department of Administration is primarily an enterprise service agency, and we provide core business functions that are the administrative backbone for state agencies. So when admin works, state government works. This funding proposal in House File 1830 will help admin do our best work and be innovative to accommodate agency needs. Specifically, the bill supports our efforts to provide more equitable and transparent services to our partners. It addresses the increased demand for our services, which has been significant and utilizes our expertise to address current agency needs for building reconfigurations. I would like to highlight the importance of some of these recommendations that were included. House File 1830 addresses admin's rising costs and, accommodations, uh, and accommodates the increased demand for our services. Requests for reviews and assistance from other agencies and the public has steadily increased over the last few years while our staffing levels have remained relatively flat. These funds will also accommodate an important policy update to the Private Cemeteries Act and specifically support the work of the Office of the State Archaeologist. Admin has the expertise to help our state agencies to more effectively use current space. The funding in House File 1830 will provide the state with the resources for agencies to consolidate their office space and focus their operating budgets on their core missions. It will also stabilize the parking fund and protect public parking facilities while agencies work through reconfiguring their offices. Thank you for including additional authority for admin to improve grants administration oversight. These changes in funding will enhance transparency and equity in state grant making, as well as ensure that agencies have the minimal funds necessary to oversee administration of state grants. <clears throat> Access to quality translations under new Office of Enterprise Translations will enable agencies to provide important information to almost all Minnesotans, regardless of their native language. And I am most pleased that House File 1830 will allow us to continue our outreach and training for small businesses throughout Minnesota who wish to contract with all levels of state government through our APEX Accelerators or Procurement Technical Assistance Center. As you work through the conference committee process, I would also encourage you to consider uh, funding for our IT staff and Office of Enterprise Sustainability requests. I also would like to point out that admin is concerned about the requirement for mixed use development on the Ford Building site. This requirement will prevent a future project from using general obligation 
bonds and will force the legislature to pay cash uh, for the redevelopment of that site. And uh, this is a unique year where there is a large surplus, but normally we can only construct new buildings with general obligation funds, or bonds, excuse me. Finally, I'd like to reiterate our true appreciation for the inclusion of so many of the governor's budget recommendations and these investments in state government will address the increased demand for our services and ensure that those services are more transparent and equitable. I'm happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. Commissioner Showalter and on deck is Commissioner Marcourt. I feel like I'm coaching T-ball again here. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, please state your name for the record and continue with your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak on the importance of the uh, omnibus bill and the elements from uh, Minnesota Management and Budget that are in uh, this bill. No time's limited, so I'll be brief. Um, I can summarize in three general as ways uh, aspects of this bill that are very near and dear to me, to the governor, lieutenant governor, and I hope you as well. Uh, the first involves securing and maintaining foundational services and supporting state government. Without reliable funding sources, MMB uh, wouldn't be able to provide even current levels of service for the state's enterprise resource planning, for the ERP systems that all three branches of government use. That's for accounting, human services, financial reporting, and other things. The bill creates sustainable funding sources to secure these systems that serve as the backbone for everything that happens as state government operations. Apart from our ERP systems, which have a structural deficit, the cost of doing business is rising for everyone, including MMB. The omnibus bill provides additional operating funds to recognize those growing costs, which I appreciate. Second area uh, is providing strategic leadership that maximizes investments and resources and fiscal oversight for every part of state government. Uh, the bill authorizes additional FTE for core financial management and oversight uh, functions at MMB, including statewide federal funds coordination, budget analysis, banking and payroll services, debt management, and regulatory compliance. And the bill expands MMB's internal controls and accounting team, which establishes a statewide internal control audit office, protecting taxpayer dollars and ensuring state government works as efficiently and effectively as possible. I appreciate the additional resources you're directing to these needs. Third and final area, uh, prioritize people, people-centered and good government solutions. The legislation establishes the enterprise uh, strategy and performance team at MMB to centrally coordinate state strategic planning efforts, cross-agency policy analysis, and planning around the core long-term challenges that face Minnesotans. The language also expands MMB's capacity to provide capital budget outreach and assistance, particularly for capital projects owned by nonprofits or political subdivisions that do not already participate in the capital budget process. The omnibus bill provides funds to, for a cross-agency work group to develop minimal data collection standards for race, ethnicity, gender identity, and disability status, and develop a roadmap and timeline for implementing these data standards. I want to thank the chair. Uh, for including updates to the Compensation Council. The governor's recommendations uh, varied slightly, and we'd like to continue conversations, but with the chair, but in the committee, but we know we're closer to aligning uh, with his recommendations. And I also want to just recognize that this process is moving very quickly. And I want to highlight that some aspects of the governor's revised budget recommendations that we may want to work with the chair uh, to include in language in this bill. But you know, overall, as you know, uh, the language of this bill only became available last night, and we're still combing through it And uh, as we uh, work through the details. So we may have additional comments later, but overall, I want to thank the chair, the committee, uh, for just including so many of the governor and lieutenant governor's recommendations in this bill. So uh, with that, uh, chair, representatives, uh, I stand for questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Marquardt. And on deck is John, uh, Com Deputy Commissioner, Etchen? Eichten. Thank you, sir. Eichten. So, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, a huge, uh, my name is Paul Marcourt, the Commissioner of Revenue. And I just, a big, big thank you to Madam Chair and members of the committee for uh, funding Governor Walz's request for the Department of Revenue. And this will allow us to continue the excellent service that we provide to our customers throughout the state and also allow us to 
uh, maintain the IT capabilities and support that are crucial to the Department of Revenue. And as I mentioned here before, uh, the Department of Revenue, like many agencies, is a big window uh, to state government by our citizens. And so uh, our excellent staff the Department of Revenue takes that responsibility very seriously. And this will allow us to continue to have an efficient system uh, of enforcement and collection and assessment uh, and administration of our revenue stream that funds our important services. And members, I have to remind all of you, exactly three weeks from today, April 18th, is the income tax due date. And as of today, we've received about uh, one half of the three million returns, income tax returns that we expect to receive this filing season and uh, have put out about 900,000 uh, refunds, an average of about, we process that right now, an average of about eight days. So uh, this funding is very important to keep those staff levels up to continue to provide those excellent services. So again, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, member of the committee, um, thank you so much for this uh, budget appropriation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And Mr. Eichton, uh, if you could come up and then on deck. Last but not least is, oh, whoa, change, change in the lineup here. Uh, oh, <laughs> Mr. Callagher, you're on deck. No, Mr. Eichton, you're up right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this happens in T-ball too. Much <laughs> better. Mr. Chair, thank you. That's, that's why I didn't last long in T-Ball. Um, for the record, my name is John Eichton, Minnesota IT Services uh, Deputy Commissioner. First, I want to thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, committee members, for your recognition of the importance of investing in modern technology uh, as a means of improving Minnesotans' experience when they interact with their state government, mm -hmm. of increasing the efficiency of state agency operations, and improving our state's overall cybersecurity posture. Minute is excited to continue to advance uh, a digital government that works for all. Uh, the investments included in the committee's budget will provide a tremendous catalyst for advancing this vision and partnership with the legislature, uh, as well as with the Technology Advisory Council, who have been our, our partners over the past few years uh, in advancing that vision. By, <clears throat> excuse me, by funding proposals for targeted application modernization, Minnesota would for the first time take a strategic enterprise approach to addressing the state's longstanding information technology debt. It will also provide an opportunity to advance human-centered services for Minnesotans that can leverage modern technology in ways uh, heretofore never seen in the state of Minnesota except in a few isolated instances. Minute is grateful for the shared recognition of the importance of reducing cybersecurity risk across the executive branch as well as the opportunity to support our local government partners uh, via the uh, cybersecurity plan that will be developed uh, to advance the state and local cybersecurity grant program. Uh, we look forward to collaboration with the Minnesota Cybersecurity Task Force as that plan is assembled and those dollars are allocated in the most uh, effective way possible to, to state and local government. Minute is equally pleased to see funding of the Enterprise Cloud Transformation proposal in the governor's budget recommendations. This proposal, proposal is crucial for accelerating the transition of the executive branch uh, from on-premise architecture to more resilient cloud-based infrastructure that builds a modern and scalable foundation for the previously mentioned proposals to build upon. Also want to thank you for the inclusion of policy proposals uh, that were advanced this session to modernize Minute's underlying uh, enabling statute and advance recommendations from the Technology Advisory Council uh, related to uh, information telecommunications technology account. Uh, while other proposals included in the governor's budget recommendations were structured somewhat differently uh, in the bill before, Minute recognizes the need to develop a fiscally uh, responsible budget for future years, and we look forward to continued partnership in future sessions to identify some sustainable funding paths for these proposals as they move into operations and maintenance modes. Finally, we want to note the inclusion of funding uh, for the perpetuation of public land survey corners. Minute through the Minnesota Geospatial Information Office stands ready to support the administration of this program as noted in House File 1231. In closing, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for recognizing the risk and the service delivery constraints imposed by aging legacy technology 
and taking a major step forward this session via this budget package toward addressing these risks and positioning state technology to better meet the expectations of Minnesotans in the digital age. Uh, we look forward to continued partnership with the committee and thank you again uh, for advancing these critical investments. Thank you, Mr. Eichmann. And last but not least, Mr. Oh, we have one more after this. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Kelleher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Chair Cleavorn. I'm David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. Simply want to say thank you for the inclusion of the governor's recommendations for uh, operating adjustments to maintain current levels of service and the initiative for earned income recovery. Uh, these two initiatives will help us to fulfill our mission to serve all Minnesotans to preserve and share history across the state. Uh, we will be able to pay our hardworking and dedicated staff and maintain a network of 150 buildings at 26 sites across the state with uh, all of the uh, operational needs that, that come with a statewide network like that. So again, thank you for your support mm -hmm. and uh, we look forward to working with the chair and the committee as you move forward in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keller. All right. Miss Alice. And if you could please state your name and title for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Hewitt, um, Chair Cleavorn, with Nash, and members of the committee. My name is Marie Ellis. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. The Minnesota Council of Nonprofits is a statewide membership organization, and our mission is to inform, connect, promote, and support the nonprofit sector and individual nonprofits across the state. I am here to offer a profuse thank you for including provisions in your bill that would support the state's oversight of its grants to nonprofits. As I've said in this committee before, nonprofits rely on the public's trust to further our missions, and appropriate oversight is critical to that end. I'll note as well that these provisions do have bipartisan support um, and would provide more centralized support and guidance at the Office of Grants Management develop, improve, and implement standards and policies for data keeping and analysis, as well as outreach and training. And as well, I think you all know, a roadmap towards including a grants management platform that all of the state agencies would use, uh, which would lead to better transparency and cost efficiencies. I'd love to end my testimony there, but I do have one significant concern. <laughs> Uh, which is, um, I'm looking at the detailed spreadsheet on line 99, the increase in oversight at the Office of Grants Management, and I see that the funds there have been front-loaded to, um, to the 24-25 the biennium and then zeroed out in the 26-27 biennium. So that's a significant concern because that work is ongoing. It's not a one-time cost. Um, so we uh, ask you to reconsider that um, to provide ongoing funding in the base for oversight of the state's grants to nonprofits. Um, and we'll continue to work together on that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate that. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify on the bill? Please come down and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Justin Stoperon. I'm the anti-monopoly director with the Minnesota Farmers Union, which is a grassroots organization representing family farmers, ranchers, and rural communities. Uh, I'm just here to uh, give our thanks for the funding for the Attorney General's office uh, in this budget. Um, our members care about this. Our, our members made limiting uh, corporate control and protecting competition in the marketplace a key priority for our organization this year. Um, this because farmers uh, find themselves on the front lines of our concentration crisis. They face extreme concentration uh, when they go to purchase inputs. They also face extreme concentration when they go to get their goods uh, to market. And yet is the, um, and, and concentration is not just an issue in agriculture. Um, the Boston Federal Reserve Bank uh, recently found that uh, Concentration across the economy has increased by 50% since 2005. And the Economic Security Project estimates that at current 
uh, rates of consolidation uh, will have precisely one company uh, in the U.S. by 2070. Uh, and yet, as the AG's office uh, mentioned earlier, they're operating with less staff than they did just a couple uh, decades ago. And so we really appreciate uh, the increased funding uh, for the office. Uh, also appreciate the, the two and a half million dollars that's set aside in FY24 specifically for uh, antitrust and, and nonprofit oversight. Um, this is a really great opportunity for the legislature to address a wide range of issues from the loss of family farms and small businesses to declining wages to the high prices uh, that Minnesota, Minnesotans are facing. So thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, thank you for, uh, for the inclusion of all of this in the, in the budget. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on the amendment? Please come up and state your name for the record. Hi, how are you? Hi, my name is Phil Rains. I'm representing the Minnesota Society of Professional Surveyors. I uh, just wanted to step up and say thank you very much to the author uh, for all the work that's done on this for the public land survey system. Uh, it's a vitally important system. We've had about 150 years of deterioration, uh, and this is a great step to uh, start moving us to, to uh, fix that system and hopefully uh, guarantee all your land rights as they should be. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Seeing none, this concludes the uh, public testimony today. Um, uh, uh, Madam uh, Chair, would you like to say anything before we? I think there are a couple of members of our uh, committee who have a few comments. Did you want to? So, to our committee members. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Chair Cleborn. Just uh, on the state archaeologist, I'd like to follow up uh, with, because I think there are Amish burials that may not be um, included or considered, and uh, just to make sure that they're in the language that's covered here that we're addressing and respecting uh, what's happening there. So I'd be happy to follow up with the archaeologist on that. Thank you for bringing that to thank my you, attention. Thank you, Mr. Han uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hansen. Anyone else wishing to test, uh, to, uh, to Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author, can you map out for us what the next couple of days will entail uh, as it uh, relates to this bill, amendment deadlines and so on, just so that uh, all members and members of the the largest group we've had in committee, I think, to date, uh, can understand what's going to happen as we move forward. So I would like to ask uh, Ms. Rudolph to go through the timeline since she does the actual posting, and I didn't bring my notes for that <laughs> with me to the table. So if I could ask Ms. Rudolph to talk about our timeline for moving this forward. Ms. Rudolph. Uh, Chair Cleburne, Chair Hewitt, and Representative Nash, the the, uh, on Wednesday, tomorrow, Wednesday at noon, amendments will be due. On Thursday, we will take any additional testimony. We will do markup and passage, and all of this is posted on our webpage. Thank you, Ms. Rudolph. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Rudolph. Mr. Uh, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author. Um, and I, we, we briefly addressed this last night, but I'm just trying to figure out are we going to merge this with the policy omnibus uh, in ways and means, or is it going to get merged in the floor? Is it going to have two flying independent of each other, uh, just so that we understand how to properly address amendments that we may or may not have? Chair sure, Cleborn. Thank you very much. And as I said last night, uh, Lead Nash, at this moment, the bills are moving separately. And I would encourage you to prepare amendments on the floor as the bills are separate. And uh, just saying, I did have my notes with me for the roadmap, so thank you, Ms. Rudolph. But at, at present, they are separate bills, and I do not have further guidance for you at this time. Is there anyone else that would like to make a comment or ask questions? Seeing none, additional testimony will be taking place on Thursday. Uh, markup will also happen, and passage. So until then, right. thank you, Chair Cleborn. Thank you very much.
I would just be um, committee members. I just want you to know the bill is laid over. Um, my uh, budget bill as amended is currently laid over.